North America is home to hundreds of railroads and tens of thousands of locomotives, so naturally, there's bound to be the occasional oddball here and there. Today we'll be recognizing five of these obscure and unique machines. Number 5. GE BQ23-7 General Electric's Dash 7 platform was a very successful freight locomotive in the 1970s, an era when North American railroads were changing quite a bit. As car-centric infrastructure began to get its grip on American society, people stopped riding passenger trains and said choosing to drive cars like this, and maybe even this. In turn, passenger trains began to fall into a state of disrepair, with railroads focusing more on the consistent profit of freight trains. In the pursuit of even better profit margins, railroads began to experiment with technologies such as the end of train device, a machine that promised to do away with the caboose. On railroads such as the Seaboard Coastline, these end of train devices were tested, although before the technology proved viable, the railroad wanted to keep former caboose crews on payroll. Instead of doing something smart, like assigning them to other trains or yard duties, these crews would ride along in the cab of trains and provide emotional support for the engineering conductor. In 1978, the SCL placed an order with General Electric for 10-7 engines with an enlarged cab similar to that of an E60 electric locomotive. These larger cabs would allow for five seats instead of two, once again allowing the seaboard to do away with the caboose. Of course, after just a few years, the seaboard realized that the additional three crew members were not needed, so by the 1980s, the BQ-23s began to operate just as any traditional engine would. When CSX acquired the seaboard system in 1986, the BQ-23s remained in service, this time in CSX paint. They served as reliable workhorses up until 2001, when they were retired, not because of their unique cabs, but because of their 1970s era hardware. Unfortunately, all 10 BQ-23-7s were promptly scrapped, so if you have any razor blades from the early 2000s in your home, there could be a chance you own a small piece of one of these unique engines. While none of the BQ-23s exist today, they actually have quite a bit of historical significance for GE transportation. The BQ-23s were General Electric's first ever wide cab locomotives, which became incredibly common beginning in the mid-80s. Nowadays, wide cabs can be found on almost all freight railroads in the country, including the GE-9 and Evolution series, two of the most popular freight engines of all time. Number 4. EMD SD89 MAC At one point, General Motors' Electromotive Division was regarded as the golden standard for locomotive manufacturing in the United States, but thanks to the engineering disaster that was the EMD SD50, their reputation took a nosedive in the 80s. Luckily, in the 1990s, EMD debuted the SD70 series, an engine that would bring EMD back into the good graces of railroads. Unfortunately, just a few years later, EMD introduced a new locomotive that failed arguably even harder than the SD50 did. This is the SD90 MAC, an ambitious 6,000 horsepower behemoth produced beginning in 1995. In addition to being one of the largest locomotives ever built by EMD, it debuted the H engine, a brand new prime mover capable of producing more horsepower than any in EMD's history. This was thanks to its higher RPM design, which also meant higher stress on the locomotive. Just a few years into their careers on railroads such as the Union Pacific, EMD was receiving reports that SD90s were failing at alarming rates, but prior, EMD was prepared to expand the SD90 series to encompass a wide array of low and high power engines. In June of 2000, the first SD89 MAC was finished at EMD's plant in Illinois, and it looked similar to a late production SD90 MAC. Unlike an SD90 though, the SD89 would feature a V12H series engine producing 4500 horsepower, as opposed to the SD90's 6000 horsepower V20. Just like an SD90, it was plagued with the same mechanical issues, albeit slightly toned down thanks to repairs by EMD. Unfortunately, in part due to the PR disaster that was the SD90, the SD89 never saw any interest from railroads, with only one ever being built. Over the years, the lone SD89 sat around at EMD's LaGrange, Illinois facility, and in 2010, it was used as a testbed for the 1010 Prime Mover, a new engine developed as a more reliable version of the H engine. The 1010 was later used to power EMD's first Tier 4 emissions compliant locomotive, the SD70 ACE T4, which has seen a moderate amount of success on a small handful of railroads. Number 3 Morrison Knudsen MK 5000C the end of the 20th century was a time when railroads were in search of increasingly powerful locomotives. What used to be 3,000 horsepower mainline engines were becoming more and more powerful, and by the early 90s, 4,400 horsepower was the industry standard. Enter Morrison Knudsen, or MK, 
a smaller company known for rebuilding locomotives and rail cars since the 70s. Seeing this trend in more powerful locomotives, MK set out to build the next big step in freight rail technology. In 1994, MK made a big splash when it unveiled a 5,000 horsepower behemoth more powerful than anything that came before it. Classified as the MK 5000C, or Morrison Knudsen 5000 horsepower C-C wheel arrangement locomotive, the MK 5000 generated a record breaking 5000 horsepower out of a Caterpillar 3612 turbo diesel V12, making it the most powerful single engine diesel locomotive in American history. Five more units quickly joined the first prototype engine, and with plans to build 5500 and 6000 horsepower variants in the future, MK was set to be at the top of the American locomotive industry. Unfortunately, by the end of that year, that seemed to no longer be the case. Not only were the six demonstrator locomotives constantly breaking down on Union Pacific and Southern Pacific, but they were quickly outclassed, as in 1995, the far more trusted General Electric released the AC6000 CW, capable of 6,000 horsepower. Just a few months later, as if the MK5000 program wasn't already in enough trouble, EMD added to the dog pile with its 6,000 horsepower SD90 MAC. Ultimately, the AC6000 and SD90 never saw major success, but they were enough to dissuade railroads from purchasing the unproven MK5000s. Ultimately, Union Pacific opted to purchase the 6000 horsepower offerings from GE and EMD, while Southern Pacific decided to merge into Union Pacific in 1996. All six MK5000s were eventually picked up by the Utah Railway in 2001, and by the end of the year, all six had experienced catastrophic mechanical failures. Utah Railway's MK5000s were eventually rebuilt with EMD parts and reclassified as MK50-3s, and while they kept their unique looks, they were internally just EMD SD50s. Nowadays, all six MK50-3s are still in operation on the Kyle Railroad in Kansas, but they're far from the 5,000 horsepower monsters they were in the 90s. Overall, the MK5000 was outshined by the EMD SD90 MAC and GE AC6000s, partially due to their higher horsepower offerings, but mainly due to their brand recognition. Even though its competition was also found to be severely lacking in terms of reliability, since Morrison Knudsen was a relatively unknown manufacturer, the MK5000 never got a real chance to prove itself. Number 2. GE C39-8 CF Hundreds of years ago, the most common fuel for trains was coal, but by the 1950s, coal-fueled steam locomotives were replaced by safer, faster, and more efficient diesel-electric locomotives. For some reason in the 90s though, the US Department of Energy wasn't so sure that coal was entirely done being used as a fuel for locomotives, and thus began the coal-fueled Dash 8 story. In 1992, General Electric received funding from Norfolk Southern and the Department of Energy to build a locomotive capable of running off coal slurry, a mix of coal dust and water. The idea was that this engine would operate on trains to and from western Pennsylvania coal fields and be fueled by local coal dust. This would supposedly streamline operations around coal mines in the region and provide the coal mines with a consistent stream of revenue should railroads buy into the coal slurry fuel. Years prior, GE had built an experimental C36-8, a lower horsepower variant of their Dash 8 series, but it never received any orders, therefore it was the unfortunate locomotive slated to be converted from diesel to coal. After a few months, the C36-8 was rebuilt and renumbered to GECX609, a C39-8CF, or C-C wheel arrangement, 3900 horsepower, Dash 8 locomotive that was coal fueled. As expected, 609 soon began testing in western Pennsylvania, and it was quickly found to be, as one would expect, inefficient and impractical. In 1993, the project was cancelled, thus ending the short career of GECX609. It was later converted to Dash 9 specifications, and is believed to still be stored at the former General Electric plant in Erie, Pennsylvania. Following this experiment, General Electric switched its focus to developing locomotives with alternating current traction, which later became the industry standard for freight locomotives. Now of course, the coal fueled Dash 8 was not necessarily the reason that GE began to develop AC traction, but it goes to show that design failures can sometimes lead to breakthroughs, even if they're not directly related. Number 1. EMD DDA-40X The DDA-40X is just about the furthest from a cop-out to take the number one spot on this list. It's not only the most powerful diesel locomotive ever built, but it was also a mass-produced engine that saw well over a decade of service. Their story begins back in the late 60s, another time when railroads, Union Pacific in particular, were obsessed with building the most powerful locomotives possible. 
1969, UP had just retired the last of its powerful yet troublesome gas turbine trains, and they were looking for something that was efficient but had even more pulling power. General Motors' Electromotive Division came up with just the thing to replace the turbines, the DDA-40X. The DDA-40X, or D-D wheel arrangement, A unit, 40 model series, experimental, was a locomotive with the power of two, literally. Instead of having just one prime mover, the DDA-40X used two 645 V16 turbo diesels, generating a whopping 6600 horsepower. The first units were delivered in 1969 and nicknamed the Centennials as they were delivered for Union Pacific's 100th anniversary. Surprisingly, unlike almost every experimental locomotive ever built, the DDA-40Xs were some of the most reliable in Union Pacific's fleet, and that was mostly thanks to their 645 engines, which to this day are considered the most reliable locomotive prime movers ever built. Between 1969 and 1971, a total of 47 Centennials were built, and they quickly became the face of Union Pacific's fast freight. For more than a decade, the DDA-40Xs diligently served across Union Pacific's network, which worked well with their massive four-axle trucks and 545,000 pound weights. By the early 80s though, they began to become a little less practical for the railroad, as high fuel prices incentivized smaller, more efficient locomotives. By 1986, the last of the Centennials were retired, with a handful being preserved. Nowadays, a total of 13 DDA-40Xs remain, one of which is in working condition, while the other 34 were scrapped. The DDA-40X is quite possibly the coolest diesel locomotive of all time, and many would consider it a modern version of UP's iconic big boy. As such a historically significant locomotive, it's planned to be returned to service, currently pending restoration by Railroading Heritage of Midwest America in the near future. Ultimately, all five of these locomotives have some sort of historical significance. Whether it's something as silly as a coal-fueled diesel, or something iconic as a Union Pacific Centennial, these locomotives deserve some sort of recognition, so thanks for watching, and be sure to comment what oddball locomotives you'd like to see in a future video.